Is he streaming? Boo! So, goat. Furry. Is it streaming on YouTube now? <laughs> what? Oh, it's up now. It's up now? Sweet. Boom. Is it catching the mic? Start slideshow and here, wait. Before we do that, let me set it up here. Uh, learn, study. <laughs> <laughs> we got it up. We got it up, boys. There we go. Um, is the TV being caught in the stream or no? How much? Okay, let's move this. Oops. <laughs> can you? Can someone get the first use? <laughs> Downstairs in the kitchen. All right. Is it two o'clock yet or no? Mon, what time is it? Two o'clock. You want me to get started? Yeah. Yeah. We got people in here. Let's do this. <laughs> you know what? Let's give it like three more minutes, two more minutes. What time is it right now? Luke can actually play blindfold chess, everyone. Let's have that let's have that on record on the stream for record. What time is it? Wait, so what time is it? 201? Yeah. Okay, let's wait until like 203 or when whenever Harshal gets back. <laughs> yeah, no swearing, guys. Is there people in the YouTube chat? Who? Nitty? Okay. She's not on campus? Okay. Like how much? There's, there's a big delay, yeah. I'm just gonna scoot like all the way here then. I'll just yeah. I'll just do it like this. Oh crap. Okay. So it's gonna I'm gonna give the presentation like this, like this, Mon, you're gonna be monitoring questions. Huh? It's on the link is on the announcements, Mr. VPA. Let's see. Okay, should we should I just start now? I don't know. Uh sure as I do should we fix up the delay or no? It's not not worth it. Okay. Okay. Alright, are we ready for this? Alright. So, hello everyone. As you guys know, my name is Ryan Yu. I am a fourth year and this is my lecture on chess. If you guys can hear it. They're giving me a big round of applause. I shall, I shall do my uh, the bow, and uh, wreck Hoshel's headphones in the process. Okay, so chess. So chess is everything: art, science, and sport. This is a, this is a quote by Anatoly Karpov. He's the, he was a world chess champion for about ten years. Um, what the? Okay, technical difficulties. Art, science, and sport. Chess is a game for everyone that a, a, anyone can play it. Beginners, intermediates, and advanced players. Everyone, there's some beauty that everyone can find in the game of chess. It's as Karpov says that it's an art, a science, and a sport because you can enjoy it. Uh, you can enjoy it. You can study it precisely, like a scientist would, or you could just say, "Screw science, screw precision. Let's make something beautiful," which is what I tend to agree with. And sport. Well, some of you guys might not agree it's a sport, but 
that's that's a topic for another time. Okay, so here's a basic overview of the chess presentation. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be swapping a lot back and forth between the slideshow and a Lee chess study that I made. So first we'll be going over the basic rules, algebraic notation, phases of the game, how to get good at chess, and a famous game. And one or two famous games. So let's get this started. So board position. Um, whoa. What is this? Okay, so board position. First off, let me just switch over here. Doo -doo 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 -doo. As you can see, this is the starting position. So the first thing that I want you guys to notice is that uh, it, on, if you play online, uh, you'll see all these coordinates here. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If you're white, the if uh, whichever color you are, whether you're playing white, the white with the white pieces or with the black pieces, the bottom right hand uh, corner will always be a white square, white on the right. Um, if if you want to flip it with black, you'll see that black. It, the same thing is the case with black also. Also note that the queens are always on their own color. So if you're playing with the white pieces, the queen's on the white square. If you're playing with the black pieces, the queen is on a dark square. Uh, board is symmetrical, as you guys can see. And white moves first in every game. Okay, so that's those are the basics. Um, the pieces, the rook moves. It moves horizontally. It moves and it captures horizontally and vertically. It cannot jump over other pieces. Bishop, same thing, uh, except it mo instead of moving horizontally and vertically, it only moves diagonally. And by virtue of the way that the chessboard is set up, the bishop will always stay on its own color. It also cannot jump over pieces. The queen is a combination of both the rook and the bishop. It moves and it captures horizontally, vertically, diagonally. And let's hop over to the thing. So piece movements. So rook. I drew arrows here so that the rook can go like this. But let's say if you move here and like just like this, you'll see that the rook cannot... You'll see that the rook cannot... How do I draw arrows here? Oh, there we go. The rook cannot um, go to this square because the king is occupying it. And I don't know. Let's just make moves here. The rook cannot... In this case, the rook would not be able to jump over here. Same with the bishop. The bishops, they move diagonally. Uh, they stay on their own color. Queen, like I said, is a combination of the rook and the knight. And it's indicated by here. I see... Uh, okay. Okay. The knight. Knight moves in an L shape. Um, and the knight is... The, what separates the knight from the other pieces is that the knight is the only piece that can... By virtue of its movement, it's the only piece that can jump over other pieces. I'll show you what the L shape looks like in a second. The pawn... Actually, let's just do that now. Screw the presentation. Um, the knight. Uh, the L shape. It's like this. One thing to note is that the knight can never start on a dark square and land on a dark square. It can never start on a light square and end on a light square. It will always go from one color to another because of the L movement. The pawn can only move up one square at a time. The pawn can never move backwards, okay? But on its first, um, it's indicated by here, and it captures diagonally. So here I list, um, here's all the moves, all the valid moves for the pawn. And on its first move, the pawn has the option to go up. If I get rid of the arrows here, let me just do that for a quick second. The pawn has the option to go up two squares on its first move, but only on its first move. Okay, the king. The king is the most important piece in the game, um, and it moves one square at a time in any direction. The king is the there are certain uh, there's there are certain restrictions. You can make any move in chess so long as it adheres to certain restrictions. So. But before I talk about restri those restrictions, let's talk about check. So check is any any attack on the king that threatens with that on its next move it threatens to capture. So here you, you'll see that the rook is checking the king, okay? Because on its next move the rook is threatening to capture the king. There are three ways to get out of check. The first one is with the knight. Uh, is the first one is to move the king out of check. So here the king has six different places where. Why am I getting a challenge request? No. Um, the, the king has six different moves that you can move out of check, uh, of this rook. So that's the first option. The second is by capturing whatever piece is delivering the check. So here the knight can capture. And the third way is blocking the check. So here the knight can interpose itself between so that the rook is no longer administering check. You can never make a move. Hi, Luke. 
Um, you can never make a move that puts the king in check. So here's an example of this. You see this bishop here. This bishop here. You know what? This bishop here is, slice, is on these diagonals. And so the king can't move to these squares. Because if, if the king were to move to them, it would be in check. And that's not a legal move. Likewise, if you take a look at this queen, this queen is... I'm not used to working on this laptop. There we go. The queen is the knight is blocking the uh, the queen from checking the king, so therefore moving this knight is illegal. So you, it's important to remember that you cannot make a move that places your own your king uh, in check. Checkmate. So checkmate is when the king is in check and there is no legal move. For, there is no legal way for the king to get out of check. This is an example of a checkmate because each of the pieces, as you could see by my arrows, why are Aiden, no, we are not accepting challenge requests. Stop it. Where are you? Okay, there you are. Stop it, Aiden. Okay? Um, but this is checkmate because there is no legal way that the king can get out of check. When the king isn't in check but has no legal move, this is called stalemate. Um, and stalemate is one of, the, one of the ways that you can administer a draw. So stalemate is uh, here the king is not in check, and if it's, it's white's move, but because the king here is not in check, because the king, the queen covers these squares, all of these squares, but not the square that the king is on. The king has no legal move. It's stalemate. Is this a stupid rule? Well, that's for you guys to decide. There are some people that say that stalemate should be a win because the king can't move. There are some people that say that stalemate should be a draw. Uh, I'm not good enough to give an opinion on that debate. So, uh, I'm a fake grandmaster, as you so kindly reminded people on the stream. So, there are other different types. So, stalemate... Stalemate is just one type of draw. There are, there are three other types. There, are, whoa. There are three other types of draws. So the first one is by insufficient material. So insufficient material, uh, insufficient material, threefold repetition, the fifty move rule, and draw by agreement. Don't ever agree to a draw. Okay, just don't. Let's let's throw that out there. Don't ever agree to a draw. Insufficient. The other types. Insufficient material. Ooh, I forgot to make a slide for this. Um. Let me just, okay, some Im improv here. But insufficient material is when there, you just don't have enough material to checkmate. There are some positions, like if we have this position, this would be a draw by insufficient material. No matter, even if black is makes all the moves to try to intentionally checkmate himself, white can never intentionally checkmate with a bishop. If this bishop was off the board, uh, white, white and black, whoa, white and black, can never checkmate each other with just kings, so this would also be declared a draw by insufficient material. Okay, let's get let's get back to my study. Uh, repetition. So repetition, a uh, threefold repetition. This is a type of draw that happens when the same position occurs three times. Okay, so a very famous example of this is uh, this game. So just track how many times just track how many times each position appears on the board. But basically, both the players do this, and then um, a, a white plays here. This is the first time this position ever occurs. Uh, and for those of you guys that want to know this opening, this opening is called the double bomb cloud. I kid you not, you can look it up. But the point, the point is that the point is that if you count the number of times that this position appears on the board, this is the first time that this position appears on the board. Okay. This is the second time this position appears on the board. And the third time, so the game is declared a draw here. Now, it doesn't have to be one thing that I want to make clear about threefold repetition is that it has. It's not a threefold. It's the same sequence of moves does not have to, have to appear three times. It's the same position, because if so, let's say, let's say like I don't know, um, from this position, right? Uh, they made these moves. Because this is the third time this position has occurred on the board, it would still be a draw even with the inclusion of these knight moves. Does that make sense? Any questions that are in the chat so far? No? Okay, this should all be relatively straightforward. Uh, oh, the 50 move rule, it basically states that uh, the 50 move rule is that no capture or pawn move has been made in the last 50 moves. This draw is relatively rare to see, but it can happen. Um, agreement, draw by agreement. Yeah, don't don't agree to a draw by agreement. Just just play, don't agree to a draw. Play it out. Uh, and perpetual check 
it's kind of it kind of is because it will inevitably it, it's a draw in the sense that a perpetual check let me give you an example of that so a perpetual check would be hmm. wow perpetual check an example of perpetual check would be something like this where I know this is winning, but for the sake of, uh, for the sake of, for the sake of argument, um, just pretend that it's not. Perpetual check would be when you just keep going, when it just keeps, when you just keep on checking the opponent because you ha you want to salvage your position. Uh, you you do a perpetual check when you were in a winning, when you were in a losing position. But basically, the game would continuously go on like this, where a player would keep on giving checks, and eventually it would be a draw by the 50-move rule or the three-fold repetition rule. So that's why perpetual check is kind of a drawing strategy. Okay, so there are... Th Let me share the slideshow. There are, three, uh, there are three special rules. The first is castling. So castling is when the king moves two squares. The rook is placed at the, the, rook is placed at the square that the king jumps. So there are three rules that you need to know in order to castle. The first is that in the king and the rook that are cast, the king and the rook that uh, that it's going the the is that is going to be castled, it must be their first move. They can't have moved at any other time. There ha there can't be any pieces in between king and said rook, and the king cannot move out of, through, or into check. And this is why I explained the rules of check before, but let me show you guys an example of this. So castling. Uh here White can cast an ex this because this is uh let's make sure that all the conditions are satisfied. So first of all, it is the king because I set up the board like this. It is the king's for both sides. It would be the king and the rook's first move. Okay. There the spaces between uh the spaces between the king and the rook are all empty for both players, and they are not passing. There the king is not current. Neither of the kings are currently in check nor are they passing through a square that would put them in check. So the, the act of castling is white moves white moves here, the white king would move here and the black rook would jump the white rook would jump over here so that would look something like this. And for this side it would look something like that. So that's the act of castling, okay? I'll explain castling's um, advantages and uses more later on, but let me show you a situation where castling doesn't work. So here, here you can see that for white, you can see that if you were to castle this way, if you were to castle long, so towards the queen side, it's what we call the queen side because the queen would normally be on this square. It's not possible because this bishop, this bishop, um, the king would land on this uh, square and that would put the king in check. So therefore you can't castle this way. However, you can castle the other way because there are, um, because the conditions are satisfied there. Likewise, the king over here, uh, you can't cast, the king, the black king can't castle, I'm really struggling with the arrows today, uh, the black king can't castle this way because of this bishop here, but you can still castle, oh right, it's not, so you can still castle this way, and black can still castle this way. The rook, the rook can be under attack when you castle, it's just the king, every, all the rules pertain to just the king, and the only rule that pertains to the rook uh, the rook's limitation on castling is that it must be the rook's first move. Okay, uh, the second rule, promotion. Promotion occurs when the pawn reaches the other end of the board. The pawn can turn into any piece but the king. It cannot remain a pawn. And you're most, of you're most often going to promote to the queen because the queen is the strongest, but there are options. There are times where you would want to promote to something else. And one thing to note is that there are no restrictions on promotion. So when you're playing over the board chess with a real chess board, Sometimes you'll have you'll end up with two queens on the board. If you if you promote with a queen but your original queen is still on the board, you can have two queens on the board. You can have three rooks, you can have three bishops, you can have three knights. There are no limitations to promotion. The only one the only two are that it cannot remain a pawn and it cannot promote to a king. So that would look something like this. So here white would promote uh like what white would promote here to a queen, it would give you an option. You can select. In this case I select the queen. And here, black can promote their pawn too. Uh, in this case, a knight. But you know, you can do it to. You can choose. You can choose a rook and a bishop. It really doesn't matter. All right. 
on Passant, this is probably the most confusing rule for beginners, and I don't even know why I made a slide for it, because it's really hard to explain in words. You have to do it over the board, so here's a demonstration. So on Passant occurs when a pawn is on its fifth rank, is on its fifth row. So here on its fifth row. And when a pawn is here and there's a pawn in its adjacent in the adjacent column, if that pawn normally pawns can capture normally pawns capture diagonally, right? So you a player might subvert subvert this by moving their pawn up uh by moving their pawn up two squares like this. They might move their pawn up two squares like this to say that black can't capture black can't capture um diagonally. However, the en passant rule basically says on a player's first move, on a player's first uh, on on their first move, they can capture diagonally as if the pawn moved one square. Um, but let's say I make uh, let's say black makes a move like this, then on passant is no longer legal. On passant is no longer legal. Uh, question. Okay, so instances which it would be better to promote not to a queen. Those almost all, nine. I think the chess statistics show that about ninety-seven percent of the time you want to promote to a queen. But let me let me set something up on here. Uh, where's the board editor? This would be an example of when you would not want to promote to a queen. If it's White's move here. If we continue from here, oops, let's go to the analysis board. An example of when you wouldn't want to promote to a queen is like this. Uh, if you promote to a queen, you're, it's probably a draw, but this would be an example where if you promote to a knight, you check the enemy king, you can check the enemy king and win material at the same time. So this would be an example of when you don't want to promote to a queen. You'd want to, It would be better to promote to a knight. As opposed to promoting to a rook or a bishop, because like I said, queens are a combination of the rook and the bishop. So generally speaking, there's no point in really moving and promo under promoting to a rook or a bishop. It's usually almost always the promotions are almost always queens or knights, and knights even then are rare. You'd only want to promote to knights when you can win material in this form. All right. So, any other questions? Okay. So back to the discussion on on passant. So on passant. Only on the first move, as I as I explained here. So black can capture as if this pawn moved one square. And let's show it again. Uh, if black were to make this move, pawn to f5, to say to so that white to so that white can't capture, white on the next move white can capture like this. Like I said, Ampassan is one of the hardest rules to explain to beginners, and it's one of the hardest for them to comprehend. But it is a rule. And its purposes will be explained a little bit later. So, let's see. What was the next part of the presentation? Uh, algebraic notation. Okay. Oops. Algebraic notation is how players keep track of the chessboard. So each piece is given, each piece it's given its own letter. And the piece is, uh, is symbolized by a capital letter. So king is K, queen is Q, bishop is B. Rook is R. Knight is N because king is already K, so knight is N. And the pawn is characterized by a lack of a letter. Okay? And the way that algebraic notation works is that each square on the chessboard, it's like a, think of, think of, it's like a coordinate for it. It's like a, what's the thing called where you do this, this, is it, what's that called? Yeah, Cartesian plane. It's kind of like that. Think of it. Think of it like a, as a big Cartesian plane. Okay, so each square, it's uh, it's, and it's basically an ordered pair. Okay, each square on the chessboard has a name. The columns are, we call them ranks, and each each column is labeled with the letters A through H. And please note that the letters A through H here are lowercase because the pieces are with uppercase letters. Rows are file. Uh, rows are known as files, and these are la labeled with numbers one through eight. An algebraic notation tells which piece moved to what square. Um, so here's an example just of algebraic notation in action. And an example of here, let's just take, let's, let's use an example here. So pawn to, so here, F4, the lack, because we don't have a capital letter here, F4 means that it's the lack of a letter symbolizes that it was a pawn. And when you capture, 
like e takes f3, it would be you would use an x for capture, okay? And with pawns, the way that you symbolize because pawns capture diagonally, you would always uh, you symbolize because pawns capture diagonally, you symbolize which um, which file it's which uh, which file it started on. So in this case, it started on the e file, as you can see down there, and it captured to the f3 square. So e takes f3. That's how pawn captures work. Every other capture, like let's say, I don't know, let's just make a bunch of dead moves. If the king were to capture here, that would be king takes f3 because the king's the king moved to the f3 square and the x symbolizes a capture. That's algebraic notation. Yeah. So next part. So chess can be divided into roughly th into three stages. Ch the game of chess can be divided into three phases of the game: the opening, the middle game, and the end game. The opening. <laughs> It's really hard to say where the opening ends and the middle game begins, but the opening is generally speaking about the it's the first few moves of the game. I would say it's about four through ten, about four to ten moves. But there are some uh, question. Oh, okay, that's a great question. Algebraic notation for castling uh, is if you're castling if you're castling short, so castling to the king side because remember the queen would be here. If you're castling kingside, it would be 0, zero, zero or 0, 0. And if you're castling queenside, it would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That, That's the... Oh, and one more thing I forgot to mention about algebraic notation is that sometimes, sometimes you'll have pieces... You'll have... Sometimes you'll have two pieces... Like you'll have two rooks that can come to the same square. So let's go to the analysis board. If you have two pieces that can sometimes go to the same square, it's no. If you look here, it says rook f to d one. It's when you have two pieces that can go to the same square. You first take a look. You, you label the column the uh the column. So that would be the letter where the piece originally started on. So rook f to d one symbolizes that it was this f rook and not this b rook that came to the d one square. Now, let me make some more dead moves. If they're both on the same file, then you resort to the number. So that's algebraic notation. Yeah, another question? Uh, there is no algebraic notation for on the, uh, there is no algebraic notation for en passant. Promoting would be, oh crap, I closed the study again. Um, promoting would be, Promoting would be, you know what? Give me a minute. Promoting, uh, if you go, if we look at here, promoting is symbolized by the equal sign. Equals. So in this case, it would be g8 equals queen to symbolize that whatever pawn ended up there promoted to a queen. In this case, it would be f1 equals knight. That would be the algebraic notation for promoting. And you can another thing about en passant is that. I said there isn't, but sometimes players like to symbolize this capture. They'll they'll initialize it as EP for en passant, but that's really that's not necessary. Another question. As any other capture, yeah. It, the, the algebraic notation for en passant doesn't change. It's just like an ordinary pawn capture. Okay, so the opening is the first. Blah. The opening is the first few moves of the game, um, and there are some there are a set of opening principles that each chess player seeks to achieve in the open. So that is, you need to develop your pieces, control the center, and bring your king to safety, most mostly by castling. Okay. So the reason why you want to control the center is if we go to a chessboard and bring up the starting position. If you want to, when you control the center. Because the center, uh, because if you control the center, you're able to more easily exert your control to the other sides of the board. You're more easily able to control the king side and the queen side. And when you control the center, you generally speaking have more space. Space is a concept that I'll talk about later on in this video. But know that in order to in order to properly play the other phases of the game, the middle game and the end game, you need to control the establish control of the center in the opening. It doesn't it doesn't matter it doesn't matter whether or not you control the piece. Uh, Generally speaking, you want to control the center with pawns, 
uh, you want you want to uh, most people you want to generally control the center with pawns, but you can also do it with pieces to a certain extent. Although that's that's a little tricky. Um, uh, develop your pieces. Developing your pieces also comes with the idea that you need to control the center as well. So here we have a common sequence. So pawn to e4, pawn to e5, knight to f3. The knight on f3, it's attack. You want to develop the you develop the knight because it's it's hitting by moving the knight out. You're actively hitting this pawn, and you're fighting for control of the d4 square as well. So black would often respond knight to knight to c6 to defend the pawn and counteract white's claims to the d4 square. Each move in the opening is, each move in the, you, that's that's the importance of developing your pieces because by developing them, you bring them out so that you can occupy more space and control the center. The other important element of the opening is bringing the king to safety often by castling. So let's just make a move here. This move is also developing the piece. It occupies, it takes control of the d5 square and it potentially pressures this pawn. And this f7 pawn is only defended by the king which is why a lot of openings seek to hit this pawn. But the other advantage of moving this bishop out to c4 is that you prepare castling immediately. And castling is most often the way that is most often the way that you achieve king safety. Even though it even though you can potentially restrict the movement of your king by putting it onto the side of the board where it doesn't have as many squares and it, it can run away to. It's much hard. All the pieces are if all the pieces are going to be in the center of the board, you don't want your king necessarily at the center of the board because it can be vulnerable to all forms of attack, which is why it's so important to move the king to the, uh to, the, to one of the sides of the board by castling. Some opening tips that I have for you guys is first, take the time to think about how your opening moves will impact your position. So the, the two examples I give you are as follows. So you don't want to ever move the same piece twice. Because if you move the same piece twice, and I'll show this to you guys later on. If you move the same piece twice, you're just wasting time. Where, where you could be spending time developing your other pieces. By, if you just keep on repeatedly moving your knights all over the board, your opponent could control use that as an opportunity to control more space. And the other thing that you have to think about how your moves will block the development of your other pieces. This is best given through an example. So let's go back here. Let's take the following sequence of moves. If we go here, this pawn to e3 move, right? It blocks the development of this bishop because now the bishop is only restricted to going to this d2 square. Whereas if you move this bishop before and then and then you you put in this pawn, this bishop is our, this bishop you can see that this bishop is far more active on because it hits all these squares on on this diagonal than it is on its on then in this position, right? So th this is what I mean by being careful to uh, see how your pieces will impact your development. Another example that I'll give you guys of this is something like this. You don't want to move your you don't want to necessarily move your bishop out here. The reason is that now you've restricted the movement of this d pawn, since pawns can only move forward, but they can't ever move if they're blocked by another piece. So you, this bishop, it's going to take you're going to have to spend an extra move to get this bishop out of the way before you can move this, develop this other bishop. This is what I mean when I say think about your opening moves in that sense. Now, let's go back to I, I told you guys not to move the same piece over. Let me give you an example of why. Let's just say I move this pawn here. Uh, this knight back, and I kept on moving this knight back and forth. I know this is an exaggerated example, but look how, if I move the, if you move the same piece over and over again, look how much more developed black is compared to white. Black has his king in the center. Black has more pieces out, and black has better control of the center. This is why it's important to not move your pieces. It's, this is why I this is why a lot a lot of beginners are told not to move the same piece twice. Obviously, there are some exceptions, like if your piece is attacked you're going to have to move your piece, right? But if you can avoid moving pieces twice in the opening, you generally uh and if you if you can avoid moving pieces twice in the opening or you don't have a good reason to then you generally speaking want to avoid moving your pieces twice. Everything clear? Any any Okay. Knights before bishops. So the reason why we say knights before bishops is because generally speaking knights are less flexible. You know where the knight because of the the way that the knight moves, you generally speaking are going to know where the knight is going to be most active. So here, knight h three 
If you put the knight on h3, it only controls these squares, right? But when you compare that to the knight on f3, it controls all of these squares. This is due to the, the, the virtue of where the knights are stationed at the beginning of the game and the way that the knights move. You generally are going to know where the knights are going to be better. And but bishops, you don't know where like you don't know where the bishop if the bishop is necessarily going to be better here, here, here in this position. And there are many other positions where the bishop can move to a bunch of different squares, which is generally speaking why we say that knights should go out before bishops. All right. Uh, opening breakdown. Okay. This isn't I want so I want to show you guys how the opening um sort of all how these opening principles all come together. Do not play this opening. I'm just using this opening because it's a good example of it's a good example of explaining the sequence of it, but it this is an extremely complicated opening that I do not recommend for beginners, but I'll just give you guys a breakdown of how this goes. E4, white makes a claim in the center, controls these pawns, E5, black does the same thing. Um making his own claim in the center. Knight to f3 attacks the pawn, knight c6 defends the pawn and can, and matches black's claim for uh, white's claim for the d4 square. This bishop to b5 move, you're threatening to remove you're threatening to take this knight and in the future you're threatening to take this knight and then take the pawn. So you're indirectly applying pressure to this pawn. It doesn't work right now because let's say if you take White has this move where you hit the pawn, but it's it's an idea for the future. It's not to be done immediately. But bishop b5 indirectly applies some pressure. a6, this is one of those times where you it's okay to move your bishop twice because if you don't move your bishop, I'm just going to take it. So you want to move your bishop here because you want to maintain pressure here. Knight to f6, develop a piece, attack this. And this is, this is why I don't really recommend this opening, but I'm just using it as an example. Because here, it, this move isn't intuitive. This move isn't intuitive, but there's there's a reasoning for it that's kind of beyond the scope of this lecture, but just take my word for it that you shouldn't play this position. Uh, bishop b7, just developing a piece, and the reason why is that if you were to take this pawn earlier on, uh, if you take here, this, is, this could potentially lead to some trouble for black that a lot of players just choose to avoid. So they this blocks it, and now it actually prepares to take this pawn. Rookie one defends the pawn, and now this capture is a legitimate this 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 capture is a legitimate threat. So now black plays b5, black castles, and you can sort of see that you can sort of see this development of how all the opening principles come together, because both sides have claim both sides have good claims in the center, um, both sides have their pieces out, both sides have their kings to safety. This is how the opening would be played at. This, this is how the opening is to be played. <sighs> Following the opening, you have the middle game. Yeah, question? My favorite opening. My favorite opening is the one I showed you. And let me tell you what. It's tangent time. Let me tell you why. So an, a big element of chess, especially at the, the higher the level you go, it's not really, it's not as important as, um, as if you're a beginner, generally speaking, the openings are eh. You can get away without not knowing opening knowledge, um, but at the at the at elite levels where they're playing chess professionally for a living, opening prep, uh, preparing your openings and getting a surprise in the opening is a big is a big part of creating a decisive uh, or of getting a decisive outcome in a game. The opening I showed you is the martial attack, and it's my favorite opening because those those of you that know Vlad. Vlad would used to play the opening with white all the time, and I would always lose to him. I hated that, so I started researching and I found this opening sequence. I knew he would always play the same sequence with white over and over again, so I researched this sequence of moves, and I kept on winning games against him. So that's why it's my favorite opening. If uh, Some suggestions for the opening is find an opening for beginners, is find an opening that's relatively simple, that follows all the opening principles. And if you're an intermediate player, so if you're an intermediate player or if you're better than me like Samuel or Luke are um then you kind of want to start and this is something that I tell Luke all the time once you get once you know the basics the basic opening principles start getting to know your opening more in depth um and start learning the ins and outs of your opening and how you're supposed to play the middle game which nicely transitions over here 
So the middle game is the stage of the game that follows the opening. It begins when the kings are first are it, generally speaking, it begins when the kings are brought to safety and some of the pieces have been developed. Again, it's hard to pinpoint where exactly the the opening ends and the uh, middle game begins because everything changes around. And actually, for some of the positions, the what we what we would consider the opening would generally be what we would we would consider the the opening in the middle game. It's a blurry line; you don't really know where it ends. And there's some if you show a position to different players, even of similar strength, someone would. One player might say, oh, that's the opening, and another player might say, oh, that's the middle game. It really depends. But these are, generally speaking, the aims of the middle game. So in the middle game, you're either trying to checkmate your opponent by attacking attacking them relentlessly, or creating a favorable endgame, or creating a favorable endgame scenario with a combination of tactics and strategy. The middle game is really hard to teach players how to do, because each middle game position is unique. I think... There's, I think it's like 10, there's 10 to the 80 unique, you can, you can have like 10 to the 80th unique chess games, which is 120, 10 to the 120th power. That's how many chess games that you can have that you just can't memorize it, which is why the middle game is so hard to study. New games are being played all the time, but I'm going to do the best I can. And so generally speaking, as you can see in the second point, the middle game is... I can split up the middle game, generally speaking, into two parts. Tactics and strategy. Now, I want to include a disclaimer here that strategy and tactics, they're not only relevant to the middle game. I placed them here in this lecture because that's where it's most convenient to explain. But you have to consider tactics and strategy both in the opening and the end game. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you some examples of that here. But let's get on. So tactics. So tactics are a set of moves that are... that. There are a set of force moves that result either in material gain or a superior position. For most of you guys, it's going to be material gain. But there, are, as you get higher and higher up, and players, as you get stronger in playing, as your playing strength gets stronger, players aren't going to give you give you free pieces or pawns. So that that's when tactics start shifting from a material perspective to a, a positional perspective. Tactics are the most important thing to study when you're looking to improve at chess. The reason is that. There's a saying that says ch chess is 99% tactics. And up to a certain point, the saying is true because even if you don't have, even if your opening, even if your opening or endgame knowledge isn't good, if you're able to out, out navigate your opponents through these tactical positions, you're almost always able to gain an advantage in that regard. Okay, so there are some different tactical themes that I'm going to go over. These are, by no means is this a comprehensive list of tactics. But the ones that I chose, I think, are the most important are the fork, pin, skewer, discovered attack, and deflection, also known as removing the defender. Let me show you what that looks like. So a fork is when a lesser piece attacks simultaneously attacks two pieces of greater value. Not necessarily a lesser piece, but most often, but it simultaneously attacks two pieces of greater value. That And one of them, because you only have one move at a time in chess, you can only save one of those pieces. So this would be an example of a tactic in chess, or of a fork in chess, because whichever piece that whichever piece that black chooses to save, probably the rook, because the rook is more valuable, white can end up taking the knight. That's one example of a fork. But sometimes, if the piece, uh, this is another example of a fork. This is what we call the strongest types of forks are the ones where you fork both the you attack both the king and the queen simultaneously. So this is known as a royal fork. The king is currently in check. It has to move, be and you pick up the queen. So that's another example of a fork. Now, what wouldn't be a fork is if the if the pieces are defended, uh, if the pieces, if especially if the pieces are of lesser value and they're defended, you can't really consider it a fork because why would you trade a bishop for a pawn, or why would you trade a rook for, why would you trade like a knight for, why would you give away your queen to fork a knight and a pawn, right? That doesn't make sense. So it has to be of at least of equal, if not most of the time, if of greater value, if that makes sense. Okay, so the pin. The pin is let me let me just breeze through the opening. And this is like I, this is what I said that tactical themes are are applicable not just in the middle game but also in the opening. And this is an example of a pin occurring in the opening. So here, by moving the bishop out to b4, the knight is pinned. You can't move the knight because if you do, you're gonna your king is uh, your king is in check. So this is called an absolute pin because let's uh, let me just make a random move for black. 
or for white. Um, this is called an absolute pin because you can't really, you can't ever, you can't ever move. This knight can't ever move because otherwise the king would be in check. Now, if white were to play this move, well, this knight is also pinned too because the knight is protecting something of greater value. This is the, this is what characterizes a pin is that the piece can't move because behind it stands something greater or more valuable. Um, this is called this the pin on the king, when a piece is pinned to the king. This is called an absolute pin because who is sending me challenge request? Okay, Luke, no. Okay, so this is called an ab this is called an absolute pin because the king absolute this this knight absolutely cannot move. Whereas this is called a relative pin because the knight can move, but it's not advisable. Skewer, think of the skewer as a reverse pin. Um, something. There's something, uh, there's something, something greater needs to move or needs to be protective, which in in return gives away something less. So in this case, the rook is skewering the uh, the king to the queen because this is check the king has to move, and the rook can just pick up the queen behind it. This would be an example of a skewer. A discovered attack. I don't really know how to explain it uh, with words, so here's an example of it. So a discovered attack. You see, I would say a discovered attack is kind of like a skewer, but instead of moving forcing your piece to move or forcing an enemy piece to move you're voluntarily moving one of your own pieces so here if this bishop wasn't here if it was white's turn and this bishop wasn't here i could take this queen right so but this bishop is in the way but what i can do here is move the bishop i, I can move this i can move the bishop to h7 this comes with check the king has to take and i take the rook this would be an example of a discovered attack where we're by moving away this by moving this bishop away, we would be discovering attack. Now it's important to note that this would also still be considered a discovered attack, but you know it's not as strong because it comes with check. Okay, uh, the other the alternative comes with check. Now removing the defender, removing the defender is given this scenario. So this knight, let's the knight and the knight and the queen here. They're being they're lining up to they're lining up to this this square to this h7 square right but the problem is that this knight if we can get rid of this knight the knight is guarding this h7 square if we can get rid of the knight that's checkmate so an example of removing the defender or uh, removing the defender would be taking the knight it comes with check and however they take whether it be with the pawn whether it be with the bishop we move here and that would be checkmate and if the king moves here, even if the king moves here, well, this is still checkmate. That's an example of removing the defender. The other element of middle game is strategy. So strategy is the attainment of is ooh, is either the attaining or trading uh trading for long. It's more strategy is more focused on the long term. And there are several strategical themes that most often, sometimes you can gain them for free when your opponent messes up. Like material, material is most often correlated to tactics, but they are still they still form a strategical element. But if your opponent screws up and gives you free material, well, now you have material, right? But oftentimes you're going to have to trade various aspects of these for something else. So the strategical elements that I've chosen to focus on are material, king safety, space, tempo, and pawn structure. Okay, so material that's just the amount of pieces you have. King safety is how safe your king is. Space is the number of squares. Uh, of squares in enemy territory that, territory that your pieces control. If you have more space, it means that you control more squares in the enemy territory than uh, it means that you have more squares that you control in the in your opponent's territory. Tempo is time in terms of moves, which I'll explain later, and pawn structure is the way that your pawns are structured. So let me give you an example of. Let me give you an example of the trading of advantages. So, let's take this opening. Um, real quick. Let's just do this real quick. Yada, yada, yada. All moves. So here you have a relatively simple position, but we can trade, we can give away uh, as white here. When I play this move, bishop takes h7, 
I'm giving away material. I'm trading a bishop for a pawn to lure the to to bring the king out. This is the trading of material for king. I'm I'm giving I'm giving my opponent material in the hopes that I will checkmate him. Right. This is the example. Uh, this is this is what I mean when you say you have to trade. You have to trade different elements of strategic. You have to trade away. In this case, you're trading different strategical elements. So you're trading material here for king safety, or you'd be trading space for an attack on the king. This is how and chess at the highest level is like this, where you have to give something away to get. You have to give. You know, the saying you have to you have to spend money to make money. You have to give advantages to get advantages in that sense. So. Let me show you what tempo is. So tempo is simply referring to time. So like here, let's take this. The move bishop to b4, bishop to b5 here is not a good move because black gains a tempo by playing c6 and it forces the white bishop away. This is an example of tempo is that when you have to for when you have when you force the opponent to immediately respond to threats that you make, that's that's when you gain tempo. That's how you gain moves to gain um, a lead in development, let's say, or a space advantage, if that makes sense. It's one of the more abstract concepts of chess to explain. And pawn structure. So pawn structure is pawn structure basically just let me just let me let's breeze through this opening here. Opening moves are not relevant, but I want you to focus on the structure of the pawns. So at the end of the sequence of moves, the pawn structure looks like this, right? And the pawn structure is important because it's gonna determine how you're gonna play out the rest of the game. So let's if I simplify the position here, you'll see that the pawns are lined up. You'll see that black's pawns are lined up like this, and that white's pawns are lined up like this. White controls white's pawns control more space on the king side, right? Because you occupy this f6 square that the, the pawn on e5 controls the f6 square that's gonna be hard for the pawns to move to. Likewise, the black the black has a space advantage on the Black has a space advantage on the queen side because his pawns control more squares within the enemies within this side of the enemy's territory. So black is going to look in this within this with this sort of pawn structure. Black is going to look to play towards the queen side. So the left hand side of the board, while white is going to look to play on the king side, the right hand side of the board. That's how pawn pawn structure is really important because it dictate. Like I said, it's going to dictate how you approach the game. Are there any questions in the chat so far? No. Okay. So let's sort of see how all these come, how all these, how all all these strategical elements come to action. This is a very famous game, uh, Robert Byrne versus Bobby Fischer in the 1963 U.S. Championship. So as you can see, um, I'll just point out the strategical elements as they come up. But both pe both players are developing their pieces. They're castling their kings, and here comes the first move. Here comes the first thing that I want to point out. This move e5. So here, Fisher is what Fisher is doing is he's basically uh, what Black is doing is he's telling White if you take this pawn after this following sequence of moves, this pawn is isolated in the fact that it has it, it has no neighbors on the adjacent files. Okay, it has no pawn neighbors on the adjacent files. Because of this, because of this pawn, Black you can see, Black has a space advantage, right? But if White can if White can but it can't also be protected. So if Black is going to look to use the space advantage that he has to place his pieces on advantageous squares, while white is going to look to pick off that pawn. And so this is how this is what the rest of the game is centered around: picking this pawn. White is going to look to win this pawn, and black is going to look to checkmate the king or create some other long-term advantage. So here, this uh, this is an example of controlling space. This knight is very active, and because of the bishop on, because of this bishop on a6, it can't easily be captured. This this knight is as this knight is controlling all these squares in, in white's territory. This this knight is has a lot of is controlling a lot of space. We can say. Knight takes f2 here. Now you're giving away a knight for a pawn here, but this is trading again. This goes back to that example of trading material for king safety. You're luring this king out. So that you can play this move, so that you're luring this king out, so that you can you can fork the king, you can fork all these pieces. Now, Fisher is Fisher is a better player than me. Here, I would grab the rook, but Fisher grabs the knight. Uh, Fisher grabs the bishop because he understands. This goes back to a concept of relative value, the the value of pieces. So material, if you if you recall, one of the one of the strategy examples is material, right? Generally speaking, 
Generally speaking, a pawn is worth one, knights and bishops are worth three, so three pawns, rooks are worth five, a queen is worth nine, and a king, you could say that a king is unlimited, but in the end game, which I'll talk about more later when the king is more active, the king is worth about four, okay? But in this case, even though, wrong tab, even though the, even though the knight, even though the rook is more valuable, Fisher Fisher grabs the Fisher grabs the bishop because he understands that the bishop controls um, is defending a lot of these squares that he needs to utilize in order to checkmate the enemy king. So the bishop is controlling space that Fisher thinks the rook, the bishop is controlling. In this case, the bishop is controlling more space than the rook, which is why Fisher deems this bishop to be more valuable and captures it. And the rest of the game is just Fisher converting his advantage really cleanly, and here. I th yeah, and it's in this position that white resigns. So this is converting strategical advantages into a winning into a winning position. The combination of is strategy is one of the harder things in chess to study. I will it it's incredibly hard because there's so many different in the middle game in general. There's so many different aspects to study. Uh, there's so many different things that you have to study, which is what makes chess, a, it, which is what makes chess such a frustrating game to get good at because. As soon as you learn one thing, you're bombarded with 20 other things that you have to master. But that's... So how do you approach the middle game? So, okay, wait. So approaching... So here's some suggestions to approaching the middle game. Uh, I've said that tactics and strategy both apply to the opening and the end game as well. But another thing that I want you guys to do is when you're... When you, especially when you have time, as if you're playing games that are... You have 10, 15 minutes to think. You want to look out for checks and captures, both you and your opponent. Because the reason why you want to look out for checks and captures is because when your king is in check, you have to respond. You have to make a, you have to do something about it. So if your opponent can check your king and get a checkmate from that, well, you probably shouldn't allow that, right? The same goes for captures, but to a lesser extent. Chess is in checkers in the fact that you have to capture, you have to always capture back what is taken, but you generally speaking want to, right? So if it's a cap, if 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 your opponent, if you or your opponent capture something, it's best to take a look at it. Sometimes it'll be something stupid. Like, for example, if you're a queen taking a pawn, most of the times it's going to be stupid, but sometimes it's going to lead to mate. You never know unless you check, right? And the other thing that I want to mention is count is counting attackers and defenders before you capture. So let's go back to let's go back to this position in the opening. So e4, e5, knight f3. Counting attackers and defenders is as simple as this. Right now. I have one attacker on this pawn, and black, white has one attacker on this pawn, black has zero defenders. So if it were white's move again, white can capture this pawn for free, right? But black says, no, I'm going to add my own, I'm going to add my own defender to it, right? So, and so now if you count attackers and defenders, white has one attacker, black has one defender. So white can't win a pawn for free here. In fact, if white captures here, he'd lose, he'd lose material. So this is what I mean by counting cap. Uh, if you're if you want to capture something, make sure that obviously this goes without saying, but make sure that you have one more attacker than they do defenders. And this gets tricky when you combine tactics into it because sometimes there can be defenders that you never saw, you never expected to see. A lot of times you'll end up with positions in the middle game where you really don't know what to do. In that case, my recommendation is ask yourself what's your worst piece and how can I improve that piece. What square is that piece going to be good on? And try to get it to that square. It, that's that's when you don't you really don't know what to do in the position, right? But obviously, this is a general rule of thumb, and you're just you're just gonna have to, in order to approach the middle game. You just have to play a lot of games. I'm gonna be honest. There's there's nothing I can do to fully teach you that. So I showed you that the end game. The end game is when the end game is when there are few pieces that remain on the board as a result of trading, and the end game. Um, the end game goals are either you need it, assuming assuming that you don't have a lopsided material advantage. Okay, so like if you're up a queen or a rook, that's that would be considered a lopsided material advantage. But in the end game, you're looking to activate your king and create a queen uh, by promoting. Okay, and the reason why you want to bring your king out into the end game is because there, you've traded off all your pieces. When you when the queens, the rooks, the bishops are gone, 
checked. There's no real threat of the king getting checkmated, so that's when it's safe to start bringing the king out to the center of the board, when it would be unwise to do so in the opening in the middle game. So, to show you, to show you the importance of king activity, let me show you this king and pawn endgame that white is... So white is currently up a pawn, right? And white is looking... Because white has a material advantage, white is looking to get this pawn to the end of the board and create a queen, right? If white plays passively, like let's say if white plays like this, the game is going to be a draw because black's king controls more space. Black's king controls more space than white's king does because black's king is preventing the white king from advancing. And due to the positioning of the king, it's block the king is blocking his own pawn. But if you were to move the queen king here, then white is winning because white's king just starts to slowly shoulder starts to shoulder the king from accessing these squares and you really don't want to be moving your king back. To that square so you move your king up and the white king is able to shoulder the king out into con to eventually cr uh controlling this promotion square that's the importance of king activity in the end game okay and here's another example of now let's say what if you're in the in the reverse you still want your king to be active because you see the white king is currently controlling more space than the black king so if you were to move the white king here and just constantly follow the king you can move here or here. It really doesn't make a difference. But you start to sh you start to force because you're always in front of the pawn. Your king because you're always in front of the pawn that's promoting. Your the black the white king here is controlling more space than the black king. And eventually, what will happen is that either black will give up the pawn, or more likely this sequence of moves would happen where it would eventually result in stalemate. Like this, I know. So this this would this would eventually this this would or something like this would eventually result in actually screwed up the move order. But you get my point. Um, that's the end game. The end game is also question. So the fifty move. Uh, if you let's go back to that slide. So that's a good question. The fifty move rule in the end game. Where is that slide? Where is that slide? I think I explained it. Yeah, so the 50 move rule, it says no capture or pawn move has been made in the last 50 moves. So most endgames are going to have pawns on the board. You can avoid the 50 move rule by just moving a pawn, and then the 50 move rule starts all over again once you move a pawn. Now, there are certain endgames like bishop versus knight where it requires some techniques. So you're going to have to... The, this is why the endgame also requires study, because you have to understand what combinations are winning or not, and how to achieve those combinations in under 50 moves or not. The bishop and knight, bishop and knight versus king is one example of that, and another example would be two knights versus pawn. You have to know the proper sequence of moves and the themes uh, in order to properly achieve checkmate without breaking the 50 move rule. So that's why you can just avoid it by moving pawns, but you have to know how to do it. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Common checkmating patterns. So, checkmating patterns. These are important to know because they can they can save you time. And pattern recognition is an important aspect of chess. So let's go quickly here. Scholar's mate. Four move checkmate. I'm sure you guys have all seen this. It's when you capitalize. You attack this weak f7 square, and your opponent is, doesn't notice it, and you checkmate like this. That's the scholar's mate. This is an important sequence to know because, especially at the beginner level, a lot of opponents are just going to try to get a free win out of doing this. The way that you avoid getting the scholar's mate is if you see if you see a move like queen h5, uh, you want to first defend the pawn, and when they move it out here, you do this, this, this. You're basically just blocking the f. You're basically blocking that square. That's how you avoid the scholar's mate. The fool's mate. It's the two-move checkmate. It's the shortest. It's the shortest way you can get a decisive game in chess. Um, you play f4 like this, and then white plays g4 and f4, and leaves this diag in some way leaves this diagonal exposed, and you play uh, queen f queen h queen h4 checkmate because the king can't move here and nothing can block. That's the fool's mate. Queen versus king. This is actually something that took me a surprising amount of time to learn how to do. The way that you want to do this checkmate is first you want to cut the you want to first cut the king off as you want to first cut the king off and as much space as possible because the king moves like a rook. 
essentially this entire this all these squares are blocked off to the king, right? So the king is essentially restricted to this little box here. And you want to slowly start and you want to bring your king up. White's just going to make a lot black's just going to make a lot of nothing moves. Again, king activity in the end game. And you just once you move once you can't move your king anymore, that's when you start uh, further corralling uh, further corralling and here you have to be careful because if you move your king here or here, it's stalemate. So here you want to move your queen here to restrict your king to just the last row. And you want to leave at least three squares. You want to leave at least two squares open. So the queen here would be fine. The queen here would be fine. Anywhere on the, get your, get the opponent's king to the second row. And then wherever the king moves, that would be checkmate. That's how you mate with queen versus king. Again, it requires some practice. Um, to get this technique done in as quickly as possible. Back rank mate. Back rank mate is when the piece, when the pawn, it's usually pawns, but sometimes it can be pieces. It's when you're just blocked. So it's, it's when the, the pawns are just blocking the, the king from moving forward. And because it's on the edge of the board, the king can't obviously move backward. So we move this, let's say we just, I don't know, move this knight like this. The rook here, that's checkmate, because the king can't go here, here, without avoiding check, and the pawns are blocking it. I've gotten mated like this so many times, and the way that you avoid getting checkmated like this is you have to create some breathing room. So white, as you can see here, played pawn to h3, giving his king some room to run away to. That's a common way of avoiding back rank checkmate. Smothered mate, one of the most beautiful mates. It's when um, it's the sequence goes like this, where... It often involves a knight and a queen checking, and this concept is known as the double check. It's another type of tactic that I didn't go over. The king is in check by two different pieces, the queen and the knight, at the same time. If the king moves here, that's mate, so you don't do that. The king moves here, and this beautiful you get this beautiful move. Queen takes h7, which is uh, queen, ta queen to g8, sorry. And it's protected because it's protected by the knight, the king can't take, so the rook has to take, and the king is smothered by its own pieces, hence the name smothered mate. Rook roll. Rook roll. Why is it there? Um, the rook roll is... I call it the rook roll because Harshal calls it the rook roll and that name kind of just stuck with me. But the rook roll is as follows where you just move... You just constant. It's kind of like the queen endgame and the fact that you constantly just use checks to force the king up and you just constantly restrict the, restrict the king's options to the following to the following board, to the following row. And that, that would be an example of a rook roll checkmate. So, one last, this is the last part of the game. Uh, this is the last part of the lecture that I want to go over. It's, it's analyzing a famous game, the opera game, to see how middle the opening and the middle game go. And I know Mon is getting a little bit, because I'm going a little bit over time, but you know what? Deal with it. Um, e4, e5. So both players are making a claim to the center of the board. Knight f3. Black is attack. Uh, white is attacking this e, e pawn. Black chooses instead of knight is instead of moving the knight out. He chooses he chooses to defend the pawn like he chooses to defend the pawn like this. This is a little bit passive in that sense. And white's next move is d4. D4 is immediately attacking the center because let's say if black makes a nothing move, takes 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 and takes. White is just simply up a pawn. So for that reason. So for that reason, Black decides to say, no, you can't move this knight, and plays bishop to g4, right? Says you're not going to be able to win a pawn. Uh, this move is a little bit inaccurate because of, because of what white plays with this move. So white captures here, and instead of immediately capturing back and ending, if, white, if, if black captures back, we end up in that same sequence where white, ca white trades queens and wins the e5 pawn. So instead, black captures the knight here. Um, white recaptures because white doesn't want to be down a piece and loses queen, and black recaptures now. So, if we if we if we recall the concept of the form of checkmate, it's targeting this weak pawn, right? So white plays bishop to c4, and this is an example of white gaining tempo because black has to respond to this checkmate threat. Black cannot black does not want to get checkmated, so he has to defend. He chooses to defend with knight f6, right, which blocks the checkmate threat. But now. This is an example of where it's okay to move the same piece in the opening twice. Is that 
White plays queen b3. Uh, he's attacking both the f7 pawn and the b7 pawn simultaneously. Black can only defend one. He has to defend this f7 pawn because he does not want to end up with his king stuck in the middle of the board. So he plays queen to e7, and rather than taking this pawn, whoa, how did that happen? Rather than taking this pawn, white chooses to, rather than taking this b7 pawn and being forced to trade queens, white chooses to develop knight to c3. White says controlling, uh, getting, my, getting my pieces more active and the potential to control more space is worth more than the material, the strategic gain of material I will gain immediately. Black chooses now, uh, by moving c6, the queen now defends the pawn. Uh, bishop to g5, pinning the knight. b5. b5 is an attempt to say, uh, is is black trying to kick, kick bishop off this powerful diagonal? But white here just says, you know what? He takes. He's sacrificing material to gain, to again, to compromise black's king, black, the black king's safety. Takes, takes, it comes with check. It has to be blocked by the knight. And castles. By castling here, it's not only a defensive move, it's more of, in this case, this is one of the examples where castling is more of an offensive move than it is a defensive move. Because the king is not more, so, we're not moving the king to safety to, but we're also, it's more so the, the, the power, the, the rook is attacking this knight here. So the rook, the knight is defended, um, and white sacrifices the rook again. Uh, white sacrifices the rook because, again, he wants to keep the king in the center. And once this is taken, um, white improves white improves his piece, uh, improves the rook, and again adds more pressure to this knight, uh, adds more pressure to this rook. Okay, so white chooses to white wants white uh, black recognizes that he's in a lot of trouble here and plays queen to e6. This is to break the pin here that the bishop is exerting and an attempt to trade queens. But here comes one of the most famous sequences in all of chess history. Bishop takes. It's check, and if you if you move if you move here, well, y y I take the queen with check, so that's not good. So, and obviously you don't want to take with the queen because you lose your queen. You don't want to take the bishop with the queen because you'd lose it. So black chooses to take with the knight, and again, bam, queen to b8 check, diverting the knight. This is another example of this is another example of removing the defender, diverting the knight away because if you can get the rook here, that's checkmate. But the knight is standing in between is standing in between the rook and the d8 square. So it, by forcing the queen to by putting the queen on b8, you for the knight captures as an only move, and there you have checkmate. This is how all the combination. This is how chess. We didn't get to the end game for this game, but this is the combination of opening, the opening uh, principles, middle game tactics and strategy all coming together to form a decisive attack on the king. So that pretty much concludes my uh, oh some so last slide I'll quickly talk about some suggestions for uh, some suggestions for familiar familiarizing yourself with chess. Chess is ninety nine percent tactics, and part of tactics is pattern recognition. You have to be able to recognize. You have to be able to learn how these patterns interact with each other, in order to and you have to be able to store them in your brain in order to constantly. And from there on, you're able to recognize tactics in positions that you never would expect them to be there. A good chess YouTuber to watch is Gotham Chess. Uh, international master Levy Rosman. He's entertaining. He has quality. For beginners, he has quality content. And if your name is Samuel or Luke or anyone who is beyond just the level of a beginner, I would recommend either Chess Network or Daniel King. Some higher level chess content. And chess is like any other game in the fact that you have to practice if you want to get good. Question? Where do I recommend people play chess? Ooh, the kitchen. Uh, the kitchen The kitchen is a good place to play chess. If, you, if it's online, chess.com or Lee Chess. Those are the servers I use. Each one has their own benefits. Each one has their drawback. Each one has their own benefits. Uh, chess.com, you get a higher quality of gameplay. You get higher quality of gameplay. The puzzles are better. But it's a, because it's a freemium model, uh, you have to pay if you want more access, and I don't pay. Lee Chess, everything is free, but it's a little bit lesser quality, which Luke is giving me that, eh, it's not true, but that's what I think. Either server is good, just don't do Chess 24. Don't do Chess 24. Um, chess is like any other game, the fact that you have to practice in order to get good. Chess is not just 
a game that only smart people can good at. In fact, there's a lot of smart people who are not that good at chess, and there's plenty of sm not smart people, just truly, that are somewhat decent at chess because I've played it so much. You have, to, if you want to get good at the game, you want to practice. Uh, you got to practice at it. But at its core, if you're just playing chess for fun, do what do what makes you happy, just like anything else in life. Do what makes you happy. So the last thing I want to mention is chess tournament. On Friday, next Friday, March 4th, during board game night, one of the reasons why I gave this chess lecture is because I want I want there to be a lot of participants, so please sign up. But that concludes the chess lecture pretty much. Are there any final questions before we end the stream? One, any other questions popping up in the chat? There's a big delay. Yeah, there's a big delay. Okay, so while we're waiting for questions, Luke says he wants to play a bullet game. You want you want to watch? Okay, let's let's play, Luke. Uh. Ah. <laughs> bullet bullet chess is really stupid. Yeah. Okay. Oops. <laughs> don't don't play bullet chess if you're looking to get good at chess. Let me throw that out as a disclaimer. Oh, yikes. <laughs> don't ever resign in bullet chess. Because anything can happen. Oh, that's... No, that's not mate. <laughs> well, that's, 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 that's why you don't play bullet chess. Are there any other questions that are popping up? Okay, in that case, we can end the stream there. Again, sign up for sign up for board game night, and that's it. I'm signing off. And say hi, Shirzai.